It's now time for our main event with your host, Chris Tetrold Blaine. Welcome to Once Upon a Turnbuckle. Hi everyone, and I can finally say, after a bit of an extended rest, welcome back to a brand new episode, a brand new era as it is of Once Upon a Turnbuckle, and I couldn't think of a better way to kick it off, if I'm honest. I've got a, a real kind of bucket list guest of mine who's joining me today, um, not only uh, a New York Times bestselling author, um, not only a TV producer, but... Any wrestling fan of my era worth their salt will know this guy from his time writing for over 20 years for the WWF, WWE magazine, Keith Elliott Greenberg. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for uh, inviting me on the show, Chris. Oh, no, no, I couldn't pass up this opportunity, really. It's, um, uh, we'll, we'll touch on a few things. One of the main things that I've put in the intro, obviously, your time with WWF magazine. Um, I grew up with that. That was, you know, that the magazine was what I lived by. It was like my Bible. Um, so when I saw your name flash up and the opportunity to to at least get in touch, couldn't pass it up. So it's great to have you. So uh, thank you, thank uh, you. And it's such a strange thing because, like, for my next book, I interviewed Nick Aldis, and he goes, "Oh, I remember like seeing your name in the magazine when I was a little <laughs> kid." There you go. It's hard to hard to imagine Nick Aldis as a little kid. No. It's all it's also bizarre because I don't really see myself as being older than I was 25 or 30 years ago. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. to think of a generation of people who were reading my stuff, it seems like yesterday I just became a professional writer. There you go. And that's what they, they, what they say about what you're, um, when you're having fun or when you're doing something that you love. Yeah. It's yeah. not work, is it? So, uh, it doesn't feel like work to me. No, nah, that's cool. Because even the most stressful times are still fun times. Mm, yeah, yeah. And the product you get at the end, I'm sure, is well worth yeah, all the time, and effort, people and stress. remember it. And, you know, you're in the UK, so I don't know if you're familiar with Inside the Ropes magazine. Somewhat. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen it around. I, I don't, um, I'm not much of a follower of the new stuff, so I must admit I don't buy magazines anymore, but I have seen it. The one thing that drew me to it is the fact that the, the way the front covers are done, if they still do it like it, it is very much like the old WWF magazine. It, it, it is. It is. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's really in some ways, like here's a recent issue. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's a, a tribute to the newsstand magazines of the past. Mm. But what's interesting is they were created during COVID when everyone was locked down. It was a very ambitious undertaking. Mm. But I'm writing a column for them every month. And I, I actually said to uh, Dante Richardson, the editor in chief, I said, look, if somehow all my WWF magazine stuff blew up, it wasn't <laughs> around anymore. And all people had to remember me by was this newer stuff. I'm okay with that. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, so it's still, you can still make your passion for the industry exciting, no matter how many years pass. Uh, now, that's not true of everybody. Um, you know, if you are a wrestler, unless you are a creative force backstage, mm. at some point your body will break down. Yeah. And even some of the photographers, you know, I look at these guys, you know, at the pay-per-view shows, or as WWE now calls them, premium events. And, you know, I know these guys for a long time, mm. for a generation, and they're bending and twisting their bodies, and I'm sure they must feel the aches and pains in doing sure. it. Yeah, but no, it's good. I mean, to to say, I think writing is one of those great things. I I I'm a writer as well, not quite as you know prolific and successful as yourself but it's it's definitely an avenue where I, I lose myself and I don't think that will ever get old no um, it doesn't get old yeah so uh, let's sort of touch on where this started so did what came first writing or wrestling what, what were you kind of into uh, first? Uh, well wrestling came first in my life hmm. writing about wrestling came after I became a professional writer sure, uh, sure. but I became a professional writer at 19 okay. and um it was professional wrestling was one topic that I knew more about than other people. 
And, you know, you go back, it, it, 19 was, when I was 19, that was 1978. So once I gravitated toward the wrestling business, there weren't a lot of educated wrestling fans out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up um, in an era when wrestling was really marketed for the unwashed masses. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it was a novelty. Yeah. It's somebody who was a working journalist uh, knew so much about wrestling. Yeah. And nowadays, of course, you have people who grew up in the Attitude Era and prior to that, the Hulk Hogan Era. So basically, you have two generations mm -hmm. of educated wrestling fans. And that's something that should really be credited to Vince McMahon because right. he did change the perception of uh, this thing of ours. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a result, it brought in a different type of fan and a different type of appreciation yeah. of the art. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful way of saying it. But for Vince McMahon, for, for anyone who, who trashes him, I've done it as well for certain things that he, he he's doing to the product these days, whether you love it or hate it. I mean, he is the one responsible for what it is, really. You can't sort of, you, you can't get away from that. What, what was your, um, your experience working in the WWF? And when did that begin? How did that start firstly? And that started, and it's so funny because last week I actually ran into the person who got me into WWE. Um, okay. Edward Schutte was the editor of the WWF magazine. And we were both at the first WrestleMania. And uh, I was writing an article for Us Weekly, which still exists in the US. And um, we were just talking. And Ed was not, Ed was, had boxed and Ed still is a, is a martial artist. But he appreciated uh, the, the fighting arts mm. and he had respect for what the wrestlers put into this and had a, a very good rapport with the wrestlers. Yeah. So, but he was also a guy who had covered ivory smuggling in, you know, Kenya. Yeah. And this was a guy who had covered the race riots in the United States in the 1960s. Yeah. So this was a guy who had covered uh, Iran during the time of the Shah. So again, he was an erudite, educated man mm. who used all that, channeled all that into his wrestling writing. Okay. So we immediately had a rapport, the two of us, and he suggested, why don't you start writing for us? And as I said in a social media post after we ran into each other, so I did, and I'm still reaping the benefits. <laughs> And that was, when was it that you then broke, when did you start with WWF? Just sort of set the scene. That would be 85, on. right after so the right then, wow. Movie. And I remember he brought me backstage to a TV taping. Mm. And Vince McMahon knew who I was because I had interviewed him, uh, you know, numerous times for other publications. Yeah. And yeah. I think he even might have remembered me from when I was just a fanatical fan. <laughs> uh, you know, because at the root of everybody in this business, generally, you have a fanatical fan. <laughs> yeah. and, and so um, I remember he gave Ed a look like, what's this guy doing backstage? <laughs> like, who let this mark in here? And uh, he said, no, he's writing for us now. And Vince was uh, pacified, and that was that. As long as you weren't a threat, I suppose. And, and um, I think your, your tenure, how long were you there? It was a over 20 22 years. years, 22 years, but, you know, here's the deal there. You know, I was there 22 years. That's a long run. Mm. And I was never full time. I was uh, always a freelancer. Yeah. So I was on retainer for them, sure. which was great because they'd say, here are your three or four stories for the month. And I would mm. write those. And sometimes they'd say, look, something else came up. We need you to write this in a hurry, which I, you know, generally did. Yeah. And once in a while, they'd even throw me a little extra money because there'd be an annual report or something. That okay, yeah. yeah. So it, it was a great gig. And in fact, there was, was always extra money I was being thrown. And that's part of the reason I think I was shown the door after 22 years because a new publisher came in. Uh, and he goes, I've never seen this guy in the office once. And we paid this guy this amount of money this year. It was every year they would also give me a raise. I, and I knew the day was coming. And the right. guy said, look, for the amount we're paying you now, 
I can hire two recent college graduates. Right. And I'm like, no, no argument there. And he said, I will continue throwing you freelance though. And they did. Cool. So I never had a falling out with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked on two editions of the WWE encyclopedia. You know, I, through the years I've been given other projects. So yes, I don't, the books I've written most recently are not WWE no. sponsored books. And I can't wait for those guys to gift me an assignment. Sure. But, um, you know, I was, you know, I, I cover WrestleMania for Inside the Ropes mm -hmm. and I cover other events for uh, Inside the Ropes. And, you know, so I, I have nothing to complain about. I think that's credited to your quality of writing, your tenure there, whatever it is, probably amalgamation of both. You have the name recognition within the industry. Certainly, you know, like I say, I haven't picked up a wrestling magazine new release probably for about 20 years. But I remember you. I remember your name because, you know, like I say, it was pretty much my life for the 10 or 15 years that I did follow it as a kid. I mean, you know, look, I, I remember my reaction the first time I met Bill Apter. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, Bill Apter, for those who don't know, I mean, how could anyone not know? No, then, no, it's a, it's a wrestling <laughs> show. I think everyone's people familiar. In this world who don't, but he was you know, both a photographer and a columnist for the family of magazines that would eventually include PWI, Pro mm -hmm. Wrestling Illustrated. Mm -hmm. And I can recall being a young guy and meeting Bill after, and he's like, oh, you live in Queens? I live in Queens. Let's exchange phone numbers. And I remember looking at the phone number and thinking, I have Bill Apter's phone number. <laughs> Things are going to get good now. <laughs> Absolutely. But so interestingly, actually, just come to mind, was there ever any opportunities back then, if you were freelance for the WWF, could you have written for <clears throat> publications like PWI? In the Absolutely other not. No. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no. There was, there was no way you could. That was the competition. And in sure. fact, the uh, corporate line was... And it was not nearly as corporate as it is now, but mm. it's still corporate, was there is only one wrestling magazine, the right. WWF magazine. Now, that doesn't mean my friendships with all those other people went away. No. They certainly did not. But they weren't even allowed to take photos at the, at the, at the building. The oh, wow. Japanese photographers were for the weekly Japanese magazines. And that was to my benefit because... Uh, Two of those guys, uh, Keiji Nakayama and Shun Yamaguchi, became two of my closest friends. You know, in fact, um, you know, before COVID came in, I was planning to visit uh, Cage in Japan, and I still hope to do that within the next few months. Oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. The, the Japanese, I've always been amazed by the, the, the Japanese side of wrestling. It was one that I never really got into enough back then but it's probably out of everything that's going on nowadays it's probably the one that i could definitely dive back into well and there now there's a combination you know you have this uh this new pay-per-view coming up forbidden door mm -hmm. which is a dual aew and new japan paper yeah yeah that will be in chicago and you know there are some great talents there and i will give aew credit they've been bringing in you know, legends like Minoru Suzuki and mm. Ishii uh, Takamori. I hope I pronounced that right. I, I'm not in a position to correct you. So, <laughs> but uh, but you know, they they they've just been bringing in some and the females. Yeah. You know, Haru Saki is a. Uh, I'm I'm mangling the names. <laughs> uh, Riho, um, it, 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 but great women have been yeah. brought in. So. Mm. Is that one one major change? If you, you know, obviously you're still writing about wrestling nowadays, you know the women's scene from back when you started. Oh, certainly. To what it is now? Because you know I can remember, um, you know when when I was uh, I'm I'm just looking up the name to make sure I I definitely uh, mangled one of the names. So uh, I won't worry. Um, anyway, yeah, the women's scene certainly uh, because women were considered it best when I started out garnish on the shows, yeah. but they weren't the show. And of course, now it's standard fare. You watch WWE and the show ends. I have Monday Night Raw this week, it ended with a woman's match, uh, mm. you know, creating intrigue towards the next uh, pay-per-view or premium event as 
I, I won't be able to get used to that. I'm still, still and, uh, used to and, and that standard, no one says, wow, history has been made. No, no. And I think back when I watched it, you'd be lucky if you got one match every three months on TV yeah. for that, you know? Yeah. So um, I, I've got to throw a couple of obvious ones, sort of, you know, sticking with your time with WWF. I will call it WWF because it was. Whatever you know, we, <laughs> um, it was WWF at the time. It was. It always was to me. Um, can you remember what your first feature was that you wrote? I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, there were so many. Yeah. But no, I don't remember what my. Okay. First Probably a bit was. of an easy one there. Any sort of memorable ones that stick with you? Sort of your favorite ones or ones that come with a particular. So it was Tomohiro Ishii. Tom, no, uh, Tomohiro Ishii. So I miss I, I mispronounced the name. Don't worry, I, I, I now stand to be corrected. Um, and um, you know, this is bizarre, but I've I've been asked about this over the years. When Randy Savage and Elizabeth split up, I was fairly friendly with with Randy Savage, mm. and um. It, you know, there wasn't an internet then. So WWE felt the need to acknowledge this since they were a key part of storylines and had in fact gotten married in the ring. Now they'd been married for years yeah. prior to that, but um, you know, Elizabeth suddenly wasn't in the picture anymore. Mm -hmm. And Randy Savage uh, caught me backstage and he said, um, I'm the one, you're the one who I want to, explain this and it was you know very respectful very heartfelt mm. um didn't go, go into details and it shouldn't have mm. um but it was unfortunately we've chosen to go our separate ways and we'll always have affection for each yeah. other along those lines but you know i can remember another time and i think i recently brought this up on a podcast it was a survivor series and Right before that Survivor Series, Bret Hart had a brother who died. Dean was his name. And yeah. he had had health problems his entire life. He, he had been a referee. He had never been a wrestler. Mm. And um, Bret once told me he thought that Dean was the bravest of all of the hearts because he dealt with, you know, uh, physical adversity his sure. entire life. Yeah. And um, Gorilla Monsoon, during that Survivor Series, said wow, you know, Brett's here in the ring and his brother just died a night or two earlier. And, you know, it's amazing that he's such a fierce competitor that he showed up and he's wrestling. Mm. And uh, I was impressed with that, mm. or at least I made mental note of it. And when I wrote up the article, I mentioned that. Yeah. And uh, Brett saw the article and he came over to Ed Rusciutti and he said, um, why are you mentioning my brother's death in a wrestling story? That's a very personal thing. Mm. And um, Ed actually covered for me and made it seem as if he had done it right. and apologized. But I was more than willing to apologize to Brett personally because yeah. I knew Brett. And certainly the last thing I would have wanted to have done would have been to hurt him. Mm. But, you know, it's not like I could have texted him and said, is no. this all Different and now. also my feeling was the announcers already said Don't it on know. tv so i figured if it's on tv it's okay to write about yeah fair enough did you yeah. did he give he, he gave the impression that he wasn't happy about it because I, I thought it would have been something he was he absolutely wasn't happy oh, about okay. it and okay. um you know and he had every right to say what he felt mm. and you know um you know and i would have been more than happy to uh you know discuss it with him and express mm. You know, I don't like to apologize when I'm not wrong, but I certainly would have apologized for that. Sure. Yeah. Oh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Were there any, um, obviously, you have to kind of re remain professional, you know, while you're in a place like that. Were there any guys that you that you wrote about, that you worked with, that you really marked out or you, you tried hard not to mark out? I mean, out Bruno. I mean, I'd met Bruno prior to uh, Bruno San Martino. For, yeah, yeah. Who were born, you know, long after uh, I was. Uh, but Bruno San Martino was the champ on and off from 1963 to, I believe, 1974 or so. Mm. And um, 
I, I, I could be mistaken. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the good run. Yeah. Wait, when did, wait, sorry. He lost the title. I'm sorry. He lost the title of superstar Billy Graham in 77. So it was 63 to 77. Now, again, there was a gap in there when Pedro Morales was the champ, mm -hmm. I believe, from 71 to 74. And then Bruno was the champ again. Mm -hmm. And again, I may have gone that date, that, that date I'd, wrong. I'd By the way, the, the Japanese female whose name I mangles it is, I'm remember, is Hikaru <laughs> Shida. So I've now corrected myself. So I don't, want any, I don't want anyone going online and saying this guy is so <laughs> ignorant he can't pronounce Japanese names properly. But um, I had met Bruno prior to working for WWE, but uh, whenever I was near Bruno, mm -hmm. I felt his aura. And mm -hmm. that certainly comes from idolizing him as a kid. And Freddie Blassie, who I'd also met prior mm -hmm. to working for them, uh, and I ended up writing Freddie Blassie's autobiog autobiography, and Freddie Blassie, was my favorite wrestler growing up because we used to get wrestling from Los Angeles in Spanish in New York. There was a network on UHF. Did you have UHF in the UK? Not that I know of, no. I, I, was, might be, I might be wrong though. I only got it in like- it no. was, it, There were two dials on the television. <laughs> what, and one was the major channels and the other were these staticky channels, yeah, UHF. Yeah. It was another frequency. Yeah. And, um, you know, you could, you know, turn the dial back and forth and try to get the image in focus. Sometimes yeah. it worked, sometimes it didn't. I know what you mean. But um, we used to get uh, professional wrestling in Spanish from the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. And Blassie was my favorite wrestler. So to eventually write his book, it was really a privilege. Hmm. And um, sometimes when I read that book now, I, I mean, not that I read it from cover to cover, but mm -hmm. when I look through it, I still feel the excitement that I had when I was writing. That's it. great. Yeah, that's great. I um, I, I was going to ask anyway, actually, in, in terms of what you write, because obviously you, you've written you know, so much over the years. Is there a difference between when you're commissioned something you're, you're asked write about this and when you pick something up of something of that you want, what Naturally. you're passionate about? Naturally. Naturally. That doesn't mean that um, I, uh, you know, don't feel proud of what I've been commissioned to write. For mm. instance, Inside the Ropes recently asked me to do a story about diversity in wrestling. Okay. And so I wrote about the treatments of and the depictions of various minorities throughout the years, uh, mm. most prominently uh, African-Americans or Black black wrestlers because I think I might have mentioned Quang, Johnny Quango in there and he was in the UK mm -hmm. and um, a, as well as gay wrestlers and now um, you know I interviewed a guy called the dark um, a guy my apologies and I have a trans child also so I should know better than using uh, that, that term but uh, a competitor called the the dark chic who is, is trans mm -hmm. um, so I did get a variety of perspectives, but I also delved into history and offered my perspective. Yeah. And so even though that was assigned to me, I took it very seriously. Mm. And I think it's in the UK, you can get that issue on the stands now. It's okay. the WrestleMania issue. And I was quite proud of that. I look for that. Awesome. Um, let's talk about your your books then you know stepping away from obviously you you like you touched on you've been involved in some autobiographies with freddie blassie superstar billy graham rick flair as well am yes, i right thinking flair yeah. and and the unpublished iron chic i know uh, if, there, if there was a book out there that all of us want to have and want to be out there it's probably that one and you know you know what's so bizarre is you know no one ever explained this to me uh explicitly but i was told the stories were just so off color from the iron sheet okay. that wwe couldn't justify putting this out there and it's like i know some high executive asked how does this help our brand and <laughs> you know if you're peddling the brand is uh something that puts smiles on people's faces well yeah. Put smiles on people's faces but not the kinds of smiles no. they necessarily want no. um 
but uh, but I just participated in an A&E biography on the Iron Sheik. And the producer said to me when he interviewed me that um, WWE provided them a copy of that book. So even though the book was never released, there are copies okay. circulating around One Titan Tower, which I didn't know about. And when my last book came out, Too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution, a fan contacted me and told me he had a copy of the Iron Sheet book. And I said, how can that be? It was never released. <laughs> and he said there were some preliminary versions that were sent to media, which I didn't know about. Yeah. And he had one. I think he said he had paid like 700 US dollars for it. And if I'm correct, he resold it for like 1,200 US dollars. <laughs> now, I'm not that kind of a hustler. No. Um, and if I was, I'd probably get caught doing that. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do that, but no. it did make me think. It's, it's worth money. They, I, I hear the um, the Gary Hart biography or autobiography. Oh, it's so good, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, one day, it seemed like quite short supply. It was at some point. Um, yes, I found, it, I, I found it online at one point and I even, Put it on my desktop. So, uh, you know, if I was working on something else and I needed a break, I'd read a couple of pages. Oh, I was going to say, in the end, if that was like the holy grail of autobiography. It was a wonderful, wonderful bio. And I'll tell you this, I'm going to recommend my friend Brian Solomon, who I work with at WWE magazines. Mm -hmm. uh, he just wrote a book on the original Sheik, and I'm reading it oh, for the wow. second time. It's so good and it's so detailed. Cool. Okay, and that's a that's a guy actually. I don't know a hell of a lot about, so um, so I may well, you know, it, it, I I yeah, love picking it's, up. It's really a worthwhile read because mm. it's all. I mean, Brian can say it more articulately than yeah. I than I can, but um, you know, he's a guy who really lived kayfabe. I mean, uh, yeah. he never he avoided speaking English in public, and there's a great story in the book, and I'll let Brian tell you the rest where um. He's in a car towards the end of his life. And, and well, not the end of his life, but he's older now. He's in a car with Sabu, his nephew. Mm. And there's some fan driving them somewhere. And the fan said, wow, I enjoyed your match tonight, but he, even though you can't move, and it's too bad when you threw that fireball, you missed. And from the back seat, he threw a fireball at the back <laughs> of the guy's head and said, in perfect English, I didn't miss now. Brilliant. And what a time yeah. to use that as well. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's but there's very few there. I don't think anybody kayfabes to that degree now, even no. MJ. No. How, how has that affected your writing then? Because you obviously, when you started writing, it was kayfabe was very, still very strong um, mm. through like the eighties and, you know, some of the nineties, but yeah. now, I mean, you know, everyone's got their own level of knowledge about it. How does that impact what, how you write about it now? Well, it depends who I'm writing for, obviously. Um, you know, I have done projects over the years to promote WWE events. Mm. And when I do that, I write as if these are life and death battles. Sure. Um, yeah. when, I, um, w when I'm writing, say, an article or a book, my essential tone is, you and I both know that this is entertainment. We also know it's grueling. We also know people sacrifice their lives for this. We know they live with injuries for their entire lives and they get divorced because wrestling takes precedence over everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, we appreciate what these people do and that's the spirit in which this is being written. Brilliant. And again, I don't think it's people just my age that would appreciate that. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think, I mean, I think most well. people, you know, I write for fans who are analytical wrestling fans, mm. you know, uh, just like if you were, uh, well, the, you know, the difference is like people say, well, it's like acting. Well, it's a little different because mm. in acting, you know, I don't think Marlon Brando acted like Don Corleone when he was in public. He had some other, you know, eccentricities, yeah. but not that. And, you know, The Undertaker, 
even though he was, uh, look, I saw him do a tribute to the US troops in Iraq. And after the show was over, he went into the crowd and just sat with guys. Oh, he was wow. talking with them as long as they wanted to speak as Mark Calloway. He yeah. wasn't like the undertaker. But there is a certain amount of maintaining your character yeah. that you're not pressured to do if you're in Hollywood. Hmm. And that's fascinating to me. Yeah. And then there's other guys who just drop the character when the show is over. And that's OK, too. Yeah. It's what works for you and what works for your character. They got they got a little bit more freedom these days than they probably used to. Didn't they, you know? I, I I'd imagine. I'm not sure if there are um, certain performers who are told do not let your guard down. Mm. I you know, I know that Roman Reigns recently cut a promo after a show in his hometown, and uh, he switched to just regular guy baby face i'm from here you're from here yeah, yeah and i don't think anybody backstage was particularly angry at him for doing that mm -hmm. again he's roman reigns say, I, I don't know tickets, if, it, if ricochet did that maybe he would have had more of a, a you yeah. know a difficult time after the show mm, maybe maybe but yeah roman is roman is god at the minute isn't he i think for a long time yet yeah, yeah. Listen, Keith, I know we need to probably wrap it up a little bit because I know you're a very, very busy man. I really do appreciate you coming you. on. Um, you. I do just want to sort of touch on, you know, give you the floor for a couple of minutes. Um, let everyone know where they can find you if they want to find out more about um, what you're doing and also your latest book as well that, that I know you've, you've yeah. recently come out. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, no my latest book, which will be out in the, the fall, is called Follow the Buzzards, Pro Wrestling in the Age of COVID-19. Essentially, it deals with what we all lived through the last few years. And it's juxtaposed with real life events that were occurring, including the American presidential election, which yeah. uh, resembled some of the more bizarre angles, maybe from the Herb Abrams <laughs> era of professional wrestling. <laughs> and then, um, you know, uh, as well as Brexit. And uh, I think the review from Bill, the German magazine, was, you know, Boris Johnson, Kenny Omega, Roman Re Brock Lesnar, and Donald <laughs> Trump all in one book. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, but it, it's essentially about how professional wrestling continued when uh, the rest of the world shut down. Oh, and okay. in some ways, that was a service to all of us. Hmm. And once again, it's another example of the titans of the squared circle sacrificing their own health for the rest of us. And that's why when people say, is wrestling real? Well, as the, as the, the saying goes, it's real to me. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, follow the buzzards inside the, um, sorry. Follow the Buzzards Pro Wrestling in the Age of COVID-19 uh, is being published by ECW Press, which stands for, uh, initially stood for, I believe, um, Encyclopedia of Canadian Writing, not Extreme. Okay, Trade. I was going <laughs> to, before everyone gets and, excited. Yeah. And, uh, and it's being published by ECW Press. You can find it on their website, and I believe it is on Amazon UK and is also on Amazon in the US and probably a few other places. I believe it's also Barnes and Noble has it and probably what is the big um, bookstore in uh, in um, the UK? Because I once did a signing at one uh, of them. Waterstones is probably the biggest. Waterstones, yeah, I think, I think you can find it there too. Cool. So pre-order it, I could use the money. Hey, I'll, I'll definitely be doing that. I'll definitely be doing and, that. And, uh, and on social media, uh, I can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Keith Elliott Greenberg. And uh, K-E-I-T-H, Elliott, E-L-L-I-O-T, Greenberg, G-R-E-E-N-B-E-R-G. Look me up on any of those and you can find me. I'm kind of running, I, I think Facebook has a limit. You can only have like 5,000 Facebook friends. I think and so, I'm yeah. And I'm up to like 4,800 something, but uh, the guy st that still gives me, uh, you know, uh, uh, over a thousand, you know, over a hundred to friends. And then, um, 
Instagram, I'm still building my following there. I just went on there in 2020 when my last book, Too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution came out. And Twitter also, I'm, I'm building a following. There you go. There you go. I'm still trying to get my head around it all. I've just moved yeah. on to TikTok as well. If anyone who's watching yeah. this, I haven't done that yet. No, I don't know. I still don't know sort of where I'm going to go with it, but it's, you know, it's another string to the bow, isn't it? I mean, so. I, I have an 18 year old daughter. Sometimes, like, I'll see she's like, you know, hanging around this a, a particular guy. I'll go, what does he do? She goes, well, he wants to uh, be a professional twitch uh performer <laughs> and play video games and get money oh for of course best of luck to this, him. Is it. this is this is where this is where hobbies become um careers isn't it and yeah. then look but who am i to argue against that because <laughs> would anyone have believed that i could have earned a living writing about professional wrestling no probably not probably and not. look at us there you go and i gotta say thanks again it's such an inspiration you know uh, uh, as a, a childhood wrestling fan and a writer it's the one thing that i would love to have been able to do um because i'm fixated on one particular area i think it really limits my ability to do it which is why the podcast is so fantastic for kind of going down memory lane but you know thanks for the memories um oh i mean a me, pleasure so. and uh you know call me back when it's when my book comes out in the fall i'm Absolutely. overjoyed to come back Chris. we'll do that absolutely listen keith thank you so so much all the best with everything you've got coming up we will speak again thank and, you, uh, thank right, you so see much. you again soon good thanks if you enjoyed this episode please take a moment to like share and hit the subscribe button also follow us on Facebook and Instagram to keep updated about all future shows.